This is a dramatic reading of Deriving How to Derive Field Equations, a blog by the stand-up physicist available at science20.com. The Maxwell equations govern light, electricity, and magnetism as a trinity. The big goal for the next five weeks is to understand my variations on those field equations. I want the reader to see both the forest and the trees, the planet and the subatomic particles, the math behind the curtain. Many may fear that they don't have the math jobs to follow this five-week march. The names of the players and their jobs will be explained. There is repetition in this process that may eventually make steps sound familiar. After just three weeks, the diligent reader will be rewarded by a deeper understanding of the mathematical intricacies of light unknowable to poets or priests. My variations are nothing more than that, variations. Field equations choreograph the motion of charges everywhere in space-time. The rules are rigid in the extreme. Any breach will make global news amongst those that knew. Hmm. Yet field equations are open to more than all the possibilities we have ever seen. The flexibility arises from the complete range of space-time changes, of space-time changes, of a space-time potential. Now here is the roadmap for the next few weeks of my blogs. We start by deriving the field equations, which are known formally as the Euler-Lagrange equations. The next week we show how to use those Euler-Lagrange equations to derive the Maxwell source equations. That would be Gauss's law and uh, Ampere's law. And then we derive the homogeneous equations, which is the no monopoles rule and Faraday's law. And then I will show my first variation, which is the hypercomplex gravity equations, where instead of multiplying things together using the rules of quaternions, I use hypercomplex rules, and we end up with something that looks very similar in structure to uh, the Gaussian law and uh, something very similar in structure to the Ampere's law. Uh, there are no homogeneous equations for hypercomplex products. It's the way it is. Um, and then finally, I'll show you my unified gem field equations where I actually take the uh, Maxwell quaternion sort of thing and subtract away the hyper complex gravity things and end up with these things that are lot, lots of zeros all around but is potentially the way to get uh, a unified field theory. At least that's my hope and I'll probably make allusions to this very graph uh, in subsequent posts. So the first player on the field is the Lagrange density. A Lagrange density is all ways energy can be traded inside of a box. A Lagrange density is a bit of a mystery figure, hidden from direct view. So what physicists do is ask different questions of this Lagrange density, and then of course they get different answers. I will show here how to play with changes uh, with a potential and changes in a potential that leads to the field equations, the master choreographer of the dance of electrons. It is common to actually use the word Lagrangian for Lagrange density um, because they mean the same thing. <laughs> oh, and Lagrangian involves less typing. Mm. Well, I will actually go with the long form to remind people unfamiliar with this bit of jargon of the bread box 
the per unit volume aspect of that which knows always to trade energy. The action sums up the Lagrange density over all of space-time. Now the Lagrange density is a space density, not a space-time density. So that sum over space-time leads to mass times time. Hmm. The action can be added up over, you know, arbitrary amounts of time, you know, from picoseconds to billions of years. So that action can take all kinds of different values. You know, at this point, that doesn't appear to be too useful. Now, I am presenting this video blog uh, presuming that many of my readers have not actually taken calculus, the study of change. Or maybe they have, but they've gotten a little bit rusty. Those that have studied the subject will recognize my word substitutions, like instead of sum, you know, for integral. Even those who have taken a few calculus classes may not have learned about the calculus of variations. I know I didn't learn it when I was a, an undergraduate uh, at MIT. I took at least four or five different cal uh, calculus classes. Uh, I mean, that's well balanced education, right? Um, but, but you know, it, when, and when you do that, the, the integral, the, the summing exercises, the, the goal was uh, to use simple limits to end up with a simple formula that would give you the area under that curve. Now, the game of calculus of variation is more abstract. The goal is not to get a formula for number, but to find a function that always lives at an extreme, either a minimum or a maximum. See, functions that camp out at extremes often dictate how things move. Now, I highly, highly recommend Feynman lectures on physics and specifically chapter 19 of book number two which is a special lecture almost verbatim because uh, because I mean it's just great I mean you'll you'll get enthusiastic about this sort of calculus which unfortunately they don't often teach even at prestigious universities such as MIT no I mean you can go out of your way but it's kind of not in the, in the core subject, which is too bad. So the game we play with the action is actually to vary a variable so that whatever amount of time is used, you know, we, you know, we, we, we fix those, those endpoints there. The action does not change for that particular amount of time. Wherever the goalposts are set, near or far, uh, you know, things just don't change. Now, <laughs> that might sound boring and conservative, but, you know, we like conservatives. Uh, even the rare political conservatives, a scientist who, who can be spotted uh, on Science 2.0. There are two things, though, that, that just happened, that I just discussed. One, one was that we changed one thing, while another thing kind of didn't change at all. So the first is called asymmetry. And the second is called a conserved quantity. This is known as Noether's uh, theorem. And, um, and I recommend you know, going out and reading about Noether's theorem. Uh, it's definitely worth knowing about. So here's my kind of really brief summary of some concrete examples. Okay, so let's say you just like travel to a foreign land and you're on the street and somebody goes and they uh, hand you a Lagrangian uh, that's on a napkin. And <laughs> How foreign is this land, okay? Uh, well, you notice um, that the Lagrange density does not have uh, a factor of time in it or, or location or any angles. Uh, it has a few symbols that you don't quite understand, uh, but that's okay because you can actually say something intelligent about that Lagrange density. Time can be varied, and it's going to actually make no difference in the action. And this translates 
into energy conservation for that Lagrange density. Now the location can also be altered without changing the action y one iota. There's no x, y, or z, okay? And that leads directly to linear momentum conservation. The ability to look at angles, you know, you know, whatever angle you want to, actually leads to angular momentum conservation. So now you can look for missing things and then know that a few things are necessarily conserved. Now there are of course Lagrangians that do have time in them and position like friction and you know that, that th these kinds of things so it's not like every Lagrangian you know conserves energy it's not that's not the case either. Um, I'm just saying this is a tool for you to say hey that one conserves energy. Now the standard model is not a game of missing things. Instead, it's a game of seeing specific symmetries, which then leads to other things being conserved. If the Lagrange density has the symmetry known as SU3, then it necessarily will conserve the eight charges for the strong force known as the gluons. Now, it will also conserve SU2 and U1 symmetries because those are subgroups of SU3. And physicists have kind of put in special accounting rules to keep those symmetries kind of in separate boxes, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of digressing there. So we're going to start with a Lagrange density that depends on a four potential and the space-time changes of that four potential. The game is to vary the Lagrange density with respect to both of those, the potential and the changes in the potential. The result of this work is known as the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, the way to derive field equations for a particular choice of a Lagrange density. So in a derivation, I like to number my steps. You know, it makes it clear when I start and also when the task is done and I can leave. So we're going to derive how to derive field equations with just seven steps. Step one, start with the Lagrange density. This must be one that depends on potentials in green and changes in potential in orange. Step two, form the action. Add up all the space-time slices of a Lagrange density. The result is mass times time. Step three, vary the action with respect to the potential and the changes in the potential. The extreme functions live where the variation happens to be zero. Step four, a problem to address is with the variation in A versus the variation in the changes in A an apple versus an orange. Write out the product rule of calculus. That is, changes in the product of A times B is equal to A times the change in B plus B times the change in A. Notice that there's actually only one term that has the orange term a variation with respect to the change in the potential. The other two are both changes in A, the apple term in green. Step five, substitute for the bad guy, the variation with respect to changes in the potential, plugging in the first two terms found in the step above. Step six, the fundamental rule of calculus, which is the relationship between adding things up and letting things change, brings out the product rule, the fellow sitting in the middle. The change of the product rule term turns out to be zero because we are not changing the endpoints. So use your eraser to erase that middle term in step five. 
Step 7. The variation will be at an extreme if the stuff on the inside of the sum of step 6 is equal to 0. That is what happens if one term equals the other. Fini, French for roll the credits. A more formal presentation would have indices on that four potentials and on that upside down triangle because that's actually a four derivative. The simple looking side is actually usually pretty simple. The other side is, well, kind of scary. <laughs> uh, it's really no worse than a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, you really have to look to see, you know, if a particular thing has been used once, and if it has, then it's not going to appear in a column again. And you get to see these nice patterns. And in the next talk in this series, I'm going to write out the Lagrange density um, at, in total and completeness, and also the um, the Lagrangian for the Maxwell equations. So they're like 22 terms in all, and uh, then you've got it in the Lagrangian that has to go into 20 some odd slots uh, in the Euler Lagrange. Uh, but don't worry, <laughs> okay? Um, I will be able to chop that into really bite sized pieces uh, in the next uh, episode. Uh, so if you've made it through this derivation, uh, you'll probably be able to follow uh, the next talk. So here's my snarky puzzle. Um, and this one is actually lifted straight out of chapter 19 of Feynman's uh, lecture. Uh, here is a very simple sort of path integral sort of thing uh, for a ball moving in a gravitational field. Now, can you spot Newton's uh, law of gravity there? Uh, I hope so. And if you get stuck, or even if you don't get stuck, go ahead and uh, read, the, read the man on this subject. Uh, you'll enjoy. Thank you very much.